Hello, this video tutorial is about hydrophone selection for your SonarPoint recorders. Now, SonarPoint is a very flexible system and one of the degrees of freedom that you have is that you can swap out the hydrophone. How to do that is fairly straightforward. You open up, as you have seen in a previous video, the uh, recorder uh, we recommend first on the electronic side. I only have one screw in here. Take that out. And now I can open up the recorder. As I pull out the electronics end cap, you will already see there's a connector here at this end and that mates to your hydrophone assembly. The hydrophone now sits on the other side of the recorder. Again, you remove all the screws once more. I only have one screw in here. Take it out and remove the end cap. And here you go. So you have several options of hydrophones available to you and they break fundamentally into two categories. One is the end cap integrated type of which you see two here. This one is for operation up to 33 kilohertz. It's called the SH33. This one for operation of up to 125 kilohertz called the SH125. And they are very recognized. You will not easily damage them. And they are also programmable. Their sensitivity, their frequency response is programmable through solder jumpers that you see here on the inside. The other option is cable connected hydrophones, also sometimes called free field hydrophones. They go through a connector like this. You can order that with your SonarPoint recorder or order it as an additional device. And your cable hydrophone plugs into this connector. And now you can have a hydrophone that is arranged in a way that you want it and fully surrounded by water in all directions, which will give you the highest fidelity. So these are your two general options. And with that, we will look a little bit into the pros and cons of either hydrophone configuration. All right, let's first look in some more details at uh, cabled uh, or free field hydrophones. And we can see a use example here. Uh, there's four recorders mounted on this frame that will sit on the seafloor. And each one of the four recorders is cabled to a hydrophone, um, array, uh, hydrophone forming an array, uh, ultra short baseline array, as you can see here that we also discussed in some of the earlier tutorials. So that's one of the advantages, the mounting flexibility that you have. Uh, however, you also have to be careful, the hydrophones, uh, most of the cable hydrophones are not very rugged, uh, so you want to have reasonable protection for them so they will survive the deployment. Now, one significant advantage of having uh, a cabled hydrophone is that it's surrounded on all sides by water. And that is called a free field hydrophone. And you can see how that behaves really other, uh, as compared to an air filled one. Here, this is one of our earlier recorders on MicroMars one oil filled one, this is a sound trap here, by seeing how it reacts to a sharp pulse, a so-called impulse response. And here you see how this sharp pulse is perceived by uh, a free field hydrophone. And now look at how what we see here on the oil filled device, and you can see some reverberations going on here. It says mean duration 115 microseconds. And then here, uh, MicroMars, an air-filled device, has the highest amount of reverberations. This data is from Mark Lammers, and 
This has some uh, impact if you are, for example, have an automated classifier looking for echolocation clicks of a certain um, whale or, or dolphin. Um, having the reverberations might confuse your automated classifier. Now, another um, result of that is that uh, depending on the frequency of um, the signal here in a device, in an uh, air-filled device or a hydrophone that's mounted on an end cap, um, you will get some frequencies where you have elevated gain followed by other ones where you have a lower gain based on whether the, the interference between the, um, the direct signal and the reverberation is constructive or destructive. And we see that here for a bottlenose a dolphin click spectra seen by um, a free field hydrophone on a, on a subarray. You see a fairly smooth progression with frequency. And here um, we have MicroMars end cap mounted, and you see these peaks and valleys in the spectrum, and they are probably, I would argue, due to the reverberation. So one significant advantage of cable hydrophones is that you have that very clean uh, free free field response, um, so a very high fidelity reproduction of the sound. Um, another thing is that when you mount a uh, hydrophone uh, on the end cap of an instrument, it's quite close to the electronics. And so you can have some noise, uh, a recorder self noise getting into the system. And you can see that here, this is on a sonar point and here at uh, 22 kilohertz. Here we, we see these little clicks here in the spectrum. And that is actually as um, a buffer worth of acoustic samples is committed to the SD card. It manifests itself as a little bit of noise here. Uh, with the cable hydrophone, you don't get that. And um, the reason is simply that it's far away from the electronics and it's surrounded by seawater, which has a shielding effect. Um, uh, what uh, free field uh, cable hydrophones do we have available right now? Right now we uh, um, provide uh, or support the hydrophones that are manufactured by HTI and you would buy them through Desert Star. They are connected to our specifications and programmed. Their preamp is programmed to our specification. You do get a um, uh, calibration sheet that gives you the sensitivity for each individual unit that you receive. These are the serial numbers here. Uh, so they're individually calibrated, although they are only calibrated in a low frequency range, I believe from uh, um, a few hundred hertz to a few kilohertz is where HTI calibrates them in. Um, now moving on to the end cap integrated hydrophones uh, on your sonar point device. Here you see your sonar point recorder and the hydrophone is here where I'm pointing to right now. This is an acoustic release it's connected to. And you can see that the mounting is very, very simple here and the hydrophone is very, very rugged. It can take some banging around as you've seen in the video segment earlier. Um, here you see it underwater. This again is the recorder. This is the acoustic release. There's a sacrificial weight down here. And this one here is actually the SPP 1000 synchronization finger in the subsurface flow. So the ease of mounting and the ruggedness is certainly an advantage. And the other advantage is that um, for our hydrophones, be that the MH33 here, which is for use up to 33 kilohertz, or the MH125 for use up to 125 kilohertz, uh, you can program the frequency response and sensitivity. And that is done with solder jumpers here. You will see here dash one configuration, dash two, 
And here for S1 and S2, you would equip this sorter jumper and so on on the other ones as well. And we will now go through this. So let's look at uh, the first curve. So each hydrophone you can program in four settings, which we call dash one, dash two, dash S1, and dash S2. The dash one and dash two is uh, with relatively flat frequency response after a certain frequency, about 1000 hertz. Uh, and then the dash S1 and dash S2 are with a sloped response, which has certain advantages that we'll go over. Here we were looking at the SH33-2 uh, configuration, and I, I should say, you can tell us at the time of order how you want us to configure your recorder with dash 1, dash 2, dash S1 or dash S2. And we will do that and test it like that, but you can then change it yourself later just by moving the solder jumpers. Um, so the solid curve here is our measured noise floor. That's in decibel respective one microperscal per square root hertz RMS. And the dotted line is the full scale signal beyond which clipping will occur. And this is computed based on the characteristics of the preamp and the hydrophone. The range in between here is what we call the dynamic range between the noise floor and full scale. Um, you can see that's uh, a bit over 100 decibels here. And with the dash S2, uh, you will see that it has a noise floor at the higher frequencies above a, a thousand hertz of about uh, 50 dB. Um, and then the uh, uh, full scale signal beyond which clipping occurs is 150 dB. And the following curves, you will always see this one as a reference, so you can then compare. All right, let's move on to the SH33-1. And you can see um, uh, it has, it can accept stronger signals up to 170 dB. So if you're expecting a lot of noise or very strong signals, you might go for the dash one instead of the dash two. But you're losing also some on the noise floor here. The noise floor is about 10 dB higher. Uh, you might wonder what's this little click here. Uh, this is um, actually the self noise that I've pointed out earlier, the writing to uh, uh, from the buffer to the SD card. So this is a dash one for um, uh, somewhat reduced sensitivity and acceptance of higher noise levels or stronger signals before clipping and therefore data loss occurs. And now we will go to the first sloped response, SH33-S2. You know, you can compare it to the dash two, so it's, it's like the dash two, but it's sloped. You can see um, that the noise flow actually keeps going down further and further as you go higher up in frequencies. And now here we're somewhere in the 20 something decibel range. So this is a very, very sensitive uh, at uh, high frequencies. And then um, at, at low frequencies, it's um, about the same, a little bit more sensitive than, than um, the, uh, the dash two configuration. Uh, the, here you see the full scale signal, the clipping, very similar to dash two up to about a thousand hertz and then diverging and um, uh, you know you have a, a lower clipping level here. So where would you use this? Well an, an excellent example of that is when you are monitoring both um, uh, you know, artificial noises, anthropogenic noises that may be quite strong, say pile driving, for example, or shipping noise. If you want to see how animals react to that, so at high frequencies where you have your dolphins 
or porpoises maybe uh, in some cases. Um, there it becomes very, very sensitive, so you can pick up a faint signal. Uh, and then at the low frequencies, you can accept the strong um, artificial noise without clipping and therefore without data loss. So that is a sloped configuration here. Here we see another sloped configuration, the dash S1. It's less sensitive now. Now you can see it's about the same sensitivity as a, the, the dash uh, two at the higher frequencies, but um, your full scale point is much higher, 20 dB higher even at the higher frequencies. And here we are going up to over 240 dB at 10 Hertz. So, you know, again, your pile driving or something like this uh, while monitoring animals, this could be a good configuration. Uh, finally, let's see how these NCAP integrated hydrophones compare to the HDI-99 UHF. And um, here uh, we can see that the noise floor is about the same as the dash two but you do not see the, the spike here at um, uh, 22 kilohertz. So it's not picking up that, that noise from the recorder itself because it's on a cable, the hydrophone. Although there is a little click here at uh, a little noise at two kilohertz that seems to come out of the HDI hydrophone. I haven't fully identified what that really is about. Um, you can see that the way the HEI 99 UHF is programmed, you're actually going to get a flat response uh, to lower frequencies here to below 100 hertz. Yeah, it's quite good here, you know, even to what 50 hertz or so, and then, then it's, it starts becoming less sensitive, as you can see here as well. So that's a, a comparison of the acoustic performance of these hydrophones. Uh, summarizing what we learned here, uh, cabled or free field hydrophones, the advantages are the best sound fidelity, best sound reproduction without reverberations. They are individually calibrated, in this case by HTI. They are immune to recorder internal noise. You have a lot of mounting flexibility. Therefore, the recommended users are certainly precision sound intensity measurements. You know where that is needed maybe for uh, a permit uh, permitting purpose where you have to specify exactly how strong sound is at certain location. Uh, sound signature identification using automated classifiers where they might get confused by the reverberations and um, uh, you know specialized mounting like these ultra short baseline arrays that you've seen before. Now compare that to the NCAP integrated hydrophones. They are very rugged designs. You have programmable sensitivity and frequency response, and they are also lower cost. Therefore, the, rec the recommended uses is just if you have extended and tough deployments, you know, where your instrument might get banged around or used by third parties, this might be a more survivable choice. Um, uh, fast adaptation requirements. So when you don't know what you're dealing with, you're in the field, you know, being able to reprogram your hydrophone might be a good, good capability. You can literally do it on a boat uh, quite quickly, make your recorder more or less sensitive or have a different frequency response. Um, uh, cetacean studies with uh, uh, human analysis is one. Uh, so, you know, if you are listening to the sounds of cetaceans, a human analyst will probably be able to pick them out, uh, reverberation or not. Uh, so that's a good use for it, as well as observing the impact of loud anthropogenic noises on marine mammals where you're monitoring at the same time, very loud sounds and faint marine mammal sounds with one of the dash SX configurations. As a closing comment, I also recommend that you um, watch the video 
a segment here, the tutorial on um, figuring out the detection range for certain types of sounds. And in there you will find some uh, uh, sound examples, um, playback that might provide some more clarity about the various things that we have discussed in this particular uh, tutorial.